All right. Well, thank you all for coming to our first Blackboard Learn Spotlight session. I'm very glad that you're all here. Some of you have been coming to our workshops this week, and we'll have more next week as well as more Spotlight sessions. And I'll pull up that web page at the end and show you what else is coming up. But um, today we have Dr. Chris Genter from the School of Education, who was one of our Blackboard pilot faculty last semester. So she used Blackboard Learn. Um, early before most faculty got access to it and um, the bleeding edge of technology tried out some things that uh, maybe she's <laughs> never tried before in the online environment and tried some things she has done before with success to see if Blackboard Learn would um, do what she wanted and so today she's going to talk to us about um, specifically the, the Blackboard student collaboration tools and how those worked out for her. So um, without further ado, um, Dr. Genter. Thanks a lot, Peter. I commend all of you for being here on Friday afternoon, January 6th. <laughs> well done. And I hope that the next 30 minutes, they'll go by fast, will be useful to you. I have some slides and I put together screenshots of some of the key uh, segments of my class instead of uh, allocating time to log in and try and find it and, and uh, move around. But in thinking about this presentation, and I know several of you just came from the collaboration tools uh, workshop session, I wasn't trying to replicate what was occurring there, but I thought about what would be important and often uh, the questions that come to me is an instructor who's trying to use some of these new uh, technologies. And so let's see here if we can, hmm, let's see if this will go. There we go. So let's take a look at the session objectives. My, my first um, task, I think, is to anchor the collaboration tools to the pedagogy. The teacher in me wants to know why I'm choosing these tools in the first place. Why are these important than some of the more important than some of the others? And so I want to share with you and, and uh, talk to you a little bit about that and then we'll have some time for questions towards the end. And then uh, I think in the session that some of you just attended, there was an overview of wikis, blogs, and journals. There was a chart provided, but I want to share with you my viewpoints and um, from my experience. And then I want to actually share some experiences from the class that I used and uh, talk to you about what worked and what I was hoping would work and what I want to try uh, better next time. And that that is part of the process, I think, as we do this. So. Here are the important considerations as you're sitting here now on Friday, January 26th, and you're getting ready to take one or more of your classes into back Blackboard Learn. These would, based on my experiences, these are the questions that I think you should be asking yourself right now. First are, what are you expecting the students to do, to learn? And well, there's that lingo, student learning outcomes. You see, I put the color-coded words. <laughs> So there's some uh, visual data documentation that's that's here. But really, we do have to ask ourselves, what is it that we want the students to do? Do we want to use wikis, blogs, any of these, because th it's something new that we can use? Or d does it fill a specific need that we have? So that's the first thing. What do you? What is it that you want the students to actually do? If you can answer that, then knowing what these tools do, one of those tools may be the fit for you. If it isn't, we can do some brainstorming, either TLP with some of the pilot faculty, some of us. We'll put it all together with that. The second thing is, because these are collaboration tools, the question that I would be asking right up front, and I, I see some of my communication colleagues uh, up, up there, I'm looking at them in the audience. How can you be proactive in helping groups to be successful? I always think about this when I'm choosing to use one of these tools, because I don't want to leave a, a student out there on a a blog by himself or herself saying, where am I? What's the meaning of this? I mean, that's a good existential question. However, <laughs> we want to reel them into the content of the course. So my tips for that and, and things for you to be thinking about even before we've looked at these are the clear expectations. Consider group contracts when you're working with these. And these group contracts can be set up in such a way that the students could write them up. You could actually use, um, I know some of you are talking about using Google Docs, but you could actually use a wiki page to have them determine what their group contract is, each team. You know, if you divide them up into groups and you could actually set it up in such a way that you give them the key points that they need to consider. 
responsibility, timeline, accountability for all members, things like this. You could build that list, uh, but I think that that's going to help, whether it's a, the journal, the, the blog, or the wiki. And then certainly rubrics for assessing. This morning I was fortunate enough to attend the session on the Grade Center, and we had great discussions about different ways to assess and looking at that. And many of the, the things that occur in journals, blogs, and wikis are tied to performance assessments. They're, they're presentations, there's things that are occurring. Uh, and so the use of rubrics and certainly sharing those up front with the students so that they're, they know before they go in what's expected, that really helps with the success, I think. And then what will your assessment actually look like? And the reason I put that there is that the students are going to ask the very first day. They will ask. They will ask via email or text or any other message way that they have of contacting you as you move forward. So think about it. But if you've thought about that and you, you have some ways to move forward, then this is what will happen. I also you have some choices here and I think that it's important to think about these two before you we even start talking about the wikis the blogs or the journals I came to be using these tools because I was doing some of these assignments and then the technology came along and I went this would be a better way this tool matches the need I have so as you can see up here on the the screen demonstrations and I don't mean necessarily students demonstrating independently you could have a pair of students a trio um, or a, a small group but certainly demonstrations discussions and we certainly just got done some of us talking about the usefulness of the discussion boards debates pro con taking different positions opposite positions multiple positions and I was just thinking as we talked about the collaboration tools where you can actually assign roles to those tasks, certainly in debates that are tied to scenarios. Pretty exciting. So this is another possibility for you with that case studies in the development. <laughs> I know that it, with us, we have you know, some of our grad students um, in some of their action research work, they go out and do case studies. So we could we could pair folks, we could do all sorts of possibilities. So th this list is a, a springboard, but it's concrete instead of going, what will I do? with this student moderated discussions instead of you just looking at the information you can assign students to doing that in games now some of you might be smiling but I'll tell you that gaming is becoming a pretty big deal um, as far as designing thinking about it and using it and it's been around for a while but the technology is really lending itself to faculty and students working with this in a new um, and innovative way the last two I think are, uh, if, if you haven't used these before, these two offer the best way for entering um, <clears throat> the realm of blogs, wikis, and journals uh, through Blackboard Learn or otherwise. So collaborative writing and collaborative writing could be a, a paper, a group paper. And I've been doing those for about five years with some of my students um, through wikis. Or it could be a collaborative presentation. And that's how I tried Blackboard Learn this time um, using the built-in wiki. I wanted to do a little comparison and contrast. But those two where you're working with groups, I, I think, offer potential. So hopefully this gives you a foundation in itself, even before we look at some of the other information. Does that sound OK, folks? All right. Let's see what we got here. So. Uh, this is how I use or present information dealing with blogs, wikis, and journals, and often I'll share this with the students right up front too. It's not just for you knowing, but there's nothing wrong with letting the students know because if you're using some more than one of these in your class, they may go, well, what's the difference? And we know blogs actually go back to 1995, probably a little earlier, short for weblog. Uh, but the idea is that it's individual or it's an organization um, and it's the information and here it's the information is going out to the public from a source so it's outgoing and then folks can respond with comments a wiki is a website that allows the visitors themselves to easily add. So the information is incoming to the site and by just using those two different 
differentiation. So if I go outgoing, it's a blog. If it's incoming to a wiki and that you can collaborate, that helps the students um, understand it. Use for effective mass collaboration. And then certainly the journals have been around for a long, long time in actually written form. Some of us still keep some real ones. Some of our students keep actual ones. Some of them keep digital journals. And now you can keep it within Blackboard Learn if you desire. So a personal record or it's a diary. But it's, it's often associated with that one keyword that it's private. And the one thing with Blackboard Learn is that you can make the journal um, more open. But I've actually chose not to because the blog can accomplish the same purpose and it helped keep the definitions and the students clear on what we were using and doing. But perhaps this will help um, with you in sharing some of the information with your students. So once we know that, um, I won't go over this a whole lot because it was it was covered and I was did not want to duplicate uh, the collaboration session. But within Blackboard Learn, all of these collaboration tools, there's a similar approach, and this would be uh, a little screen capture here where you uh, want to create the blog, and you create it, and you give it a name, and I named this one Blog Sample. And then you can see all of the different blue arrows there that you can choose individual to all students. You can have uh, the index entries. And if any of you view, how many of you have you actually used blogs out on the, any of you? Yeah. I go, I've, for years, I've used EduBlogs with my students, and I've used Wikispaces and Wet Paint for the, um, as well for the wikis uh, with the students. And so I was really interested to see how Blackboard Learn could handle it, how robust it was. And I have to tell you, as a faculty member, I was pleased because it met my needs for the kind of work that I needed my students to do. Uh, it, it, it saved time for me on getting the, the, the setup, the time that was needed to involve the students and engage the students was hardly anything compared to that. Um, I know that in the discussion that some of us had previously that we're hoping that we can work towards more specific documentation for assessment. But all in all, I have to tell you that I was really pleased because it lightened my workload. And I don't know, but I'm guessing that your work, if your workload's anything like mine, yeah, I see some folks clapping their hands that that it'll continue to improve. But I was, I was really pleased. So anyway, you have here, and you can certainly grade these blogs. So this was the, the more of the, uh, the basics. So here's a screen capture, um, actually, of a little blog that I did uh, with the class from last semester. And so the course was EDCI 675. It was digital media and online learning. And it's a course that's set up for teachers. And so it was very useful for me at the beginning of the very first day of class. I took time to tell them that we were piloting. I didn't say I was. I said, we are piloting. It's going to be an adventure of discovery. You can use that phrase. You can quote me if you want, because it'll come back and be really helpful to you. Because when something doesn't work, you'll say, it's an adventure, isn't it? And But we're in it together, and we can discover. We can take notes. And you know what? It worked just fine. We didn't have anybody get upset or cranky or anything about it. Um, as you can see over here on the left-hand side on the menu, you can you can see how I set up the, the area. and. I tried to follow what was recommended um, last semester to us, that I had an information area right up at the on the menu bar for the announcements and syllabus. But it, within the content and tools is where I placed a wiki, I had a blog example, journals, et cetera. Then I put had a section for quizzes and then student resources towards the bottom. But those gray headers, the student feedback was they liked that because it was clear, it was clean, no matter what was <coughs> In them and it gave them a consistent way. So I actually built content links. I used learning modules and I built content um, course links right out so that I could put them on the menu as well as within the content area. And the students' feedback was great. That was easy for those that were really busy. And, and, and many of my students are working full time. They're out there in the public schools as teachers. And so they were, thank you, uh, as we did this. So if you take a quick look on the blog on here on the screen, pretty clean, pretty basic, but you can bring in images. 
So that header that's in there, that was you could bring it in, um, set it up, and can post the comments, and then you can see the you know the entry. So this was just a test setup that we talked about. One of the things that my students said, because we'd used EduBlogs before we worked on this, their feedback was, can we change colors? No. <laughs> so if they're into the aesthetically valuing, pleasing, well, that's a little bit limiting within this. And that's partly because um, our campus has set that up, but that's OK. Uh, I said we're focusing on the content, but the content can be more than written text. And that's my angle today, is that you can use these mashups and do some really creative things uh, with these. With the journals, if you take a look at this, uh, and the students posted them, I asked them one day in class, I said, let's just see how this works. We've tried, we've tried the blogs out there. Let's set up a journal. So I did, and you can see, uh, if you take a look up there, the, the, some of the names. But what's interesting is that I could see all of the students' journals, but I set it up so that they were individual journals. And they came back the next week and they were upset. We want to read each other's journals. They were so used to discussion boards and they were used to being able to have the links to the blogs. And I said, you're educators. Can you think of reasons why maybe students wouldn't want to share? And so then we had, actually, it was a good educational discussion. There may be times or there may be topics that you're addressing where students need to just share independently with you. And if someone were to ask me, that is one of the strengths that I see of the journal, that if they're, they're topics that they don't feel comfortable talking about with the whole group or they have something to share, they have an avenue to contact you and it's private between you and them and you can post the comments going back. So you, I put up a link, you can actually use the hyperlinks and, and then set that up uh, pretty well. So then we were, we were okay with that. So the journals and the blogs, okay. But I think that you know, the discussion boards we used extensively, and I used the wiki far, far more um, as we moved through. Here is a, a posting, actually, from the um, journal. And this was a response from one of the students. And then you can see that I responded back to her. Uh, we were using, we were looking at virtual worlds and how they're being used in the, the K-12 realm. And so they went out and investigated, and they, they made some comments. And so the writing is, um, I think, thoughtful. And then I posted some feedback just for her that was, you know, it was like, okay, so there's this conversation going on. And even students at the graduate level like to get feedback. It's so important. A little bit is better than none. And all of these tools allow for that kind of feedback to occur, and that's, that's really uh, important. Then I was looking around, and there was a surprise post in the journal. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm looking at the journals, and it says an outside observer. Now, how did an outside observer get in there and post? Well, we can take this educationally. It's actually from Laura Cedarberg, who's in charge. She's like, she's sitting here from TLP. <laughs> but she was exploring. But as I looked at it educationally, I thought it was nice because this kind of system allows for checking if there are issues or there's a problem. If you're a department chair or you're in charge of a committee and you have something set up, you, there are ways to get in and see because you, I'm looking at Laura right now, but you were able to see what was set up and how it was structured and it's beyond the instructor. Um, and that and that's fine. If certainly this would be set up with permission and things like that and I knew as part of the pilot program that that people would have access and that was fine. That was one of the things that I signed on for um, but I thought that was kind of nice and she did a nice job of just dropping in a little picture in the journal entry so we, we have that. But the wiki is where we had a lot of fun and in years past I've used the wiki uh, and I'll, I'll, I tie it in again to the, the course has some, a technology bent to it. And one of the assignments is that we investigate uh, virtual environments. And one of the virtual environments that we look at is Second Life. And so the students have avatars. And there's a bit of a learning curve there. And Chico State has a wonderful setup here, thanks to Ann Steckel and others, uh, working with uh, a Chico State site within S Second Life. And so our students get involved in that. And what I did was I set up a wiki 
and I actually the the first page of the wiki has the entire assignment and what are looking like links to you right here uh, that you have set up those are actually not links out to the internet but they are called slurls second life URLs so that they will actually take them into the virtual environment right from there and the students were like ooh which was that was kind of a fun thing to have have them receive it but for me it was very clean in that I had it all within the course context and I could set it up I could uh, organize it and then off on the left you could see uh, the wiki now much like um, some of you if you've used a wiki I created those sites the intent if we go back to the very beginning my intent was that I wanted students to understand the value of virtual uh, learning and what's occurring because these younger students they they are experiencing virtual learning some of them don't realize it and some of their parents don't realize it but it's occurring and I wanted these teachers to see that and then I wanted them to find out how it existed so I found different sites within Second Life that I felt were educationally um, useful and I gave them what I would call a menu choice and so in under number one they had two places they could want they had to visit one of the two under number two they had to visit two of the five and under number three they had to visit two of the five that I had listed there but I didn't send them out independently you had your students working in second life did you have student no you didn't I was going to did anyone has anyone else worked in second life you're all looking at me going where has she gone well that's another discussion for another day and I'll be glad to share that with you these students got together I didn't send them out by themselves we worked collaboratively first in our class they would built up some experiences in the class and then off they went from the Chico State site in and they went in teams of two or three or more and visited these sites but then they would post them to the wiki and so all of these different pages were represented each of the assign that list each one of them got a blank page and they had to respond but then I added an additional page for individual reflections because the question came up and with the pilots there's some of my pilot colleagues in here how do you grade this well I they needed to do things in groups but they also needed to respond thoughtfully and work through this and so uh, the, the there was documented evidence that I could look to for the grading I could also take a look here at the the words modified um, one of the things that's interesting is that this for me this was probably not quite as strong in the wiki side as if you use wiki spaces or one of those because under the outside wikis when you click on them you can actually see what each student put in it's color-coded it'll just show up what each one of them so I could actually say well I see that you have contributed you added several articles and and the and I, several commas that's good it's a start however <laughs> whereas some others put in several paragraphs or whatever and I could document this wasn't quite as clean in that arena so that I see that as a slight downside but I'm hopeful I'm one of these optimists that it's going to get better because th the flip side was it was nothing time wise for me in getting it set up for the students and getting them immediately involved and for the students over the years as I've done this they would get um, caught up in just trying to get their wikis or get the signed in none of that occurred so we had far better far more positive results right away with the experience and the assignment and so these are some of the students comments within the wiki as they posted so what we have is a second life wiki that summarizes these 15 pages all put together by the students and I think that that's pretty powerful and it, it's it's useful in going back for me as a, a faculty member that's engaged in this and working in this arena I have evidence and I can I have quotes that I can follow from some of the students as we go through here uh, there was there's a site out there called the World War uh, one poetry archive and the students actually you can see got in the costume as the the nurse but there were all sorts of audio clips from these World War one veterans and the poetry and things and in the in the feedback it's really tiny up there but this is where many soldiers fell in battle a poem is highlighted here anthem for a doomed youth 
um, as we stood there, we viewed the writing coming from the bottom of this trench. And so it's, it's a totally immersive experience, very different than if they were reading it from a handout or just from a, a, a static web page. So it, and my task for them was not just the content of these sites, but think like a teacher. What does this mean for teaching? And then we got to the, the part with the individual reflections, and I required them uh, to, to submit a photo of their avatar along with their reflections. And as you can see there, they all had Chico State t-shirts. <laughs> Looking good. And uh, as you can take a look here, you can see, and this is a, a fairly typical one, that I was skeptical and could not make real-world connection to the virtual world content. And so the assignment met my needs of exploring half a dozen new worlds, but the wiki also met my needs because the students could see each other's comments. They could, and they could, at any point as they logged in, they could see what each other was doing, and, oh, I didn't think about that, and they would go back and add things, or then they would uh, adjust certain things. In, in the past, some of the tips that I could tell you about with wikis, and it's one of the things that we often don't think about. Usually we're, we're concerned about students that focus on um, getting them to get the assignment completed. In the, I've had some students in doing wiki work who were, mm, shall we say, type A mm -hmm. and overachievers. And they would go in and write the whole paper for like their whole group. And then as long and then as other people started to contribute, they didn't think it was good, so they kept editing out what was being contributed. And so it was almost a reverse situation. And so that that was several years ago. And so that's why I talk about group contracts and accountability, that that part's a little bit of wisdom along the way, that it can come from both sides, that you want you want the folks that may not contribute to contribute, but you also want the others to share <laughs> and not dominate uh, with that. But this particular um, assignment, I was thrilled with. It was robust enough to hold many, many Im images that these students took or clips. Uh, they were able to hyperlink out, and they were well pleased with it. Um, so I, I feel pretty good about uh, that. This is the way that the, the takeaways that I think that I offer for you, and then we'll, we'll open this up for some discussion here, that journal blogs and wikis are all web pages. Sometimes students will say to me, well, I want to make a web page. I don't want to do a journal. I want to make a web page. Or I, wanna, I don't want to do a blog. I want a web page. So I, they are web pages. So, oh. <laughs> Journals work well for personal focus and private communication. So the, I try to make like short note-taking comments so the students, the takeaways, so information is personal. Blogs feature class topics, individual student interests, positions. Uh, you can, information goes out. Wikis can be set up in many ways and really cultivate the collaboration. The information comes in, it's posted as a group, and it can, can continually be refined um, as, we, as we take a look at that. Here's a little reference that I used on that, that slide that had the list of the, um, the collaboration uh, topics. That list actually came from this little article from EDUCAUSE, Unit 5, Collaborative Teaching and Learning Strategies. And um, the link is right there. But if you actually just typed in Collaborative Teaching and Learning Strategies, I bet you would find it uh, because I, I had no uh, trouble. And it's got a Creative Commons license, which means you, know, you appropriately cite this, which I did. It was on page one was the list uh, there. But it's, a, it's about a three-page article. And I think that it's a nice summary for you if you want to think about these things. Also, I, I've put our uh, colleagues here from the uh, technology learning program, the consultants here, is suggested resources. They've been wonderful this January as we're moving into this transition. And the Blackboard On Demand video tutorials, they have many of them, but they actually have a, a group called Communicating and Collaborating, and those are set up specifically, and they'll take you step by step if you have some issues um, with that. So those are, and then I have a, actually a, a little quote here. I don't know if some of you know, but my background's in art education, 
And Christo's the artist that goes around and covers things in orange and different things. But this is a, a quote that he has on collaboration. It is not only one person's work, it's really a partnership and a collaboration during all these years. And the fact of the matter is we're all collaborating here right now. We're all trying to make BB Learn work. And this is going to go on, not just this semester, but it's going to be continual. So there's there's bigger things at work here, and that's exciting, I think, for Chico State. So I'm going to ask you if you have any questions or ideas or thoughts. And if I went too fast, I'll back up, <coughs> handle anything. That, that was, was a sigh back there. No, 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 I'm just thinking. Was it too fast? It was a thinking one. No, okay. Go ahead. How often do you have students journal, and um, do you think there's an optimal amount of journal entries, like uh, not to overwork, but not to underwork the students, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's a fair question, and I would respond based on how most of my classes are. Uh, my classes occur for they're once a week, but they're three hours long. Mm -hmm. And so generally, I could make it a one or two week posting, depending on what the assignment was. If it's a blog, uh, and I've been, been using the blogs, I would have them post uh, once a week. If it's a journal, it's a private issue, they need a reflection, I might say two weeks, depending on the topic. Uh, independently, you know, that's it, more independent work. So. The, the, the timeline on those can be associated with whatever the task is at hand. If you want to move them and scaffold the information, you can have it weekly as you go. I think, though, that if you have class on Monday, then you have it again on Wednesday. There may not be time for reflection to be completely productive. That would be my take on it. Go ahead. Because I was listening to your wonderful presentation I was imagining you know with the with the messages email conundrum would it be do you think it would be interesting could you think you could use journaling as a replacement for messages well that's a great question Kathleen that you replacing um, the messages within BB learn with journaling it's a thought I actually chose not to use messages last semester with the pilot and the the messages were kept in-house so that it's much like how Vista was and I, I was bold I said not going to use it and I set it up to use email and that was the number one response from the feedback from my students they loved it they loved the email and it took a little bit more on my part to organize it, but the, the, the key tidbit that I would share with you is that if the students send the email from within the course, they're all labeled. So as the email comes to you, you just drop them in a folder and you can organize them. And actually because, Catherine, because I use these other tools, the number of emails I got was not unmanageable and all the others were recorded and they were in a better area for me to actually give points. But, but the response that I got back, because I did the same thing as you, I thought, oh, yeah. emails. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and you're right, they send them from snowbunny at hotmail.com <laughs> and, and they never say what class they're in or anything like that. Right. But, but the other thing is, towards the end of the semester, a lot, I had students that had lost previous emails that had things like either a thread or that had stuff I'd sent out or whatever and in messages or in the old Vista everything was still there right so that's why I was wondering if maybe the combination of the emails which I agree they like it mm -hmm. and maybe you know a dialogue through a private dialogue through journals or something like that might be a you can do that and you also though <coughs> for an, you have announcements and announcements are a way to document uh, some of the information that I really, I felt that I had far less emails because I was using the blogs in the other areas. And so it worked for me, and most likely I will not use messages, but that that's my use, uh, my choice. Can and you attach I, things in journals? Can, can they attach something in they can it You can attach things in journals. So the answer is yes, and, and as we discover today and working in some of these sessions, you can make the journals accessible and so that they're not so private. It might be that blogs are the place to go, that you could have groups. Yeah, I've used, I've used blogs for classes 
for general questions, and I but I don't want to manage them. I yeah. I'll let them help each other. Yeah, yeah. But you could set up groups mm -hmm. that have the blogs or, or whatever. So that's a real thoughtful question, and it's the answer is still unfolding on that. But it's pretty exciting. Now, one of one of the things that I would share with you is that I want to try to do new things with this new technology. I don't want to be doing old things with the new technology. Does that make sense? And it's not just because it's the technology, but can I rearrange or reconfigure some of my assignments that engages some of these students more? When I saw on that first night of class, I took the time to actually, I took the first 15 to 20 minutes and we really talked about Blackboard Learn. And I think that that's a valuable thing, and that there are going to be some changes, and we're all in this together. And I used we, not I or you. I used we, and that carried out throughout the semester, and it made a, a world of difference because if there was a glitch, the students would say, "We can't seem to find this. What do you think?" And I'd say, "Let's let's take a look." And we would, well, sure enough, let's, and so we could fix it, and uh, that worked. So, any other questions? Here? As I listen to you talk, um, I, I can see that you got really interesting things, but it worries me the grading load. Yeah. So how do you manage that? Well, actually, when I set this wiki up, um, I set it up very. I didn't actually set it up under a category like I learned about. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was in the grade center session. <laughs> I did it like I had I, I had been doing out on wiki spaces, and so. I actually went in and looked at each of the students' contributions. And since I had them paired up in, in pairs or in groups, I could go through and see the, the, those postings, but then I also had that balanced with an individual reflection within the wiki. So aside from the stats data, I had visual documentation that I could point to when I said, well, it looks here like you have one sentence here and all, everybody else wrote three paragraphs what's going on so that helped and certainly uh, using a rubric with the expectations and I make sure that my rubrics I, I the rubrics in BB learn you can actually now have instead of one point you can have more than one but keeping those rubric spans tight keeps the rubric really honest because if you start saying oh, this section's from 1 to 10, and this one's 11 to 20, it really defeats the purpose of the rubric because let's say that Stephanie, Laura, and I are all grading. What, what's the difference between 7 and 5? That's, you don't know that. So if you can keep, that, those, keep the ranges tight and use that. So that's how I approach that. And they had that up front. And they also had a, a postings rubric that I'll be glad to share with anyone for the discussion boards. I didn't, I had points, I had expectations tied to it. Um, and then I actually used the quizzes to tie in the, uh, I had quizzes for the reflections um, on the their postings so that they actually scored themselves almost before I had to. Yeah. Chris, maybe this might be something that everybody's interested in. We just created um, a wiki rubric working with Kate Tranchell. Maybe if I put that one with your discussion board rubric, maybe we can do some sort of posting on the TLP website and get them out for everybody yeah. if you'd want to collaborate with yeah, me. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. I think that, see, it's still unfolding. Collaboration in action. <laughs> so that's great. So I, I'm keeping an eye on the time and I think I'm about there. Huh? Yep. Yeah. One more question. How do you include a real outsider in your wiki? Okay, a real outsider. It's my understanding that you can go in, like uh, like we could in Vista, and you can add a guest to a class. So we need to go through TLP. No, you could. We actually in the past we had it. Laura, do you want to? Um, I, be I believe our self-service application is still being fine-tuned, but that that will be an, uh, an available choice for y'all. Right. So very much like we used to in the past, so that you could bring somebody in. Uh, yeah. That's a great question because then you could bring someone in. Yeah, Ann? Uh, I think we're still in the process that's of figuring that out. Um, that's what she said. Um, and I, th I think they need to be associated with the campus, but we're right. looking they, into seeing how and, we yeah, can bring them in. Yeah, in the past, right? you would have the uh, campus ID and then you could bring them in. Mm -hmm. 
but we we could Skype with someone and then um, we can talk about that. We actually did that. With someone. So we like to solve problems like that. That's good. Good collaboration. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Right on the wave, Jeff. So, folks, thank you so much. Time flew today. I hope it was helpful to you. Thank you.